Well, thank you. Good evening. I'm Ann Ballin. I'm the Executive Director of the South Dakota Humanities Council. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are going to start out by honoring the 2023 Distinguished Achievement in the Humanities Award winners. We would like to acknowledge first and foremost that we stand on the ground of the Yocheti Shakoween, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people. We honor and appreciate the indigenous people who have the longest relationship with this place. The South Dakota Humanities Council seeks to celebrate literature, promote civil conversation, and tell the stories that define our state. We lead statewide advocacy for the humanities, working with partners to foster literary and civic advocacy uh, throughout, uh, throughout our area. Our award winners are excellent examples of our mission and vision for the South Dakota Humanities Council. These awards honor the unique spirit of those who make lasting contributions to the humanities in South Dakota. Tonight's honorees have presented vibrant programs, hosted diverse events, and provided essential leadership, funding, and partnering to sustain a vibrant cultural landscape in South Dakota. Helping present the awards for distinguished individual, librarian, and organization will be South Dakota Humanities Council Board of Directors Chair Bobby Boylan. Thank you, Anne. Um, thank you to you and your staff for this extraordinary. Oh. Now? Better? Again. Thank you, Anne, to your staff and all of you that have worked on this event and all of the opportunity that we've had over the last couple of days. It has truly been extraordinary to be in your presence, so thank you. So tonight, I get the honor of announcing the winners. Our first honoree is Black Hills Writers Group member and novelist Karen Hall. She is a 2023 Distinguished Achievement in the Humanities Award individual winner. She is an environmental engineer with a degree in English literature Karen Hall has published novels and short stories set in two of the country's most fundamental, fundamental in industries, oil refining and hard rock mining. A past presenter at the Festival of Books, she is a longtime member and past president of the Black Hills Writers Guild. Under her leadership, the Guild published an anthology of short works by regional writers and several issues of a, of a literary magazine. Hall has just finished her third novel, this one dealing with human trafficking in North Dakota, North Dakota's Bakken oil fields. Congratulations, Karen. All right, our next honoree is Misty Burns who has been the library director for the library in Winter, South Dakota for about a year now. Missy is our 2023 Distinguished Achievement in the Humanities Award Librarian winner. Misty Burns is the library director at Tripp County Library, Grossenburg Memorial. She has conducted numerous South Dakota Humanity Council events at the library, including the annual One Book South Dakota discussion and programs from the Speakers Bureau. She enjoys the Humanities Brainstorming the Human Connection series and helping at the South Dakota Festival of Books. Misty serves on the board of the Winter Resource Center for Families, the South Dakota Historical Society Foundation membership panel, and is a member of the South Dakota Library Association. She recently earned a Hometown Hero Award for her, imp her impact on the library's Teen Advisory Board. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Our final honoree this evening is the 2023 Distinguished Achievement in the Humanities Award Organization winner. It is the Black Hills Reads United Way of the Black Hills. Black Hills Reads has partnered with South Dakota Humanities Council to bring you Young Readers One Book Program to students throughout the Black Hills since 2015. The Black Hills Readers Program, which is currently directed by Hannah Glissendorf, is an initiative through the United Way of the Black Hills that promotes early learning and literacy opportunities for children under nine. 
As a long-standing engaged supporter of the Young Readers Initiative, the Black Hills Re Reads helps coordinate Young Readers Festival events, arranges author visits to schools throughout the Black Hills, and manages the distribution of more than 2,000 books to young readers each year. Thank you and congratulations to the Black Hills Reads. Thank you very much to all of them. Let's have one last round of applause for all three of these influential honorees. And now I'll turn the microphone back over to Anne. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bobby. We will now move into our next program, celebrating our state and verse with newly named South Dakota Poet Laureate Bruce Roseland. To get us started, I'd like to welcome Dana Yost, President of the South Dakota State Poetry Society. Dana, we are hoping that you can explain briefly the role of the Poet Laureate and introduce Bruce. Um, and here's his bio, if you could share that with everyone who's here. Okay. Thank you, Ann. Um, I guess I wasn't expecting this. Uh, <laughs> so, but um, the Poet Laureate position is a, an important position culturally, um, for literacy, uh, for I don't, for spreading the spoken word in the written word among all ages in our state and among all corners of the state, uh, and which Bruce is promising to undertake. He wants to get to every place in the state, pretty much every county, and he's going to be piggybacking on our Poetry on the Road program, which we newly, newly launched. He's going to be joining that. Um, and. Uh, yeah. Bruce has a lot of commitment to poetry, commitment to writing, commitment to getting people to read and write poetry, to join in the process and enjoy poetry, finding that poetry isn't something for um, the, an elite group of people, but something for everybody. And, uh, and for every, it can be written in everyday language, it can be understood in you know, taken in in an everyday way, but have deeper meaning and, and tell us something about our lives. And I think Bruce will be a great representative uh, for the state and for our uh, poetry society. And I'll, I'll, I'll take my glasses off so I can read a little bit about uh, Bruce. No, oh, sorry. I'm going to lift this up. Bruce is a fourth generation cattleman who grew up on and still works a ranch in north central South Dakota. His award winning poetry collections include The Last Buffalo, A Prairie Cowman, A Prairie Cowman, and 2021's Heart of the Prairie. Bruce holds a master's degree in sociology from the University of North Dakota and has he has years of service as a member of the South Dakota State Poetry Society, including eight years as president. And he is also a South Dakota Humanities Council scholar. Um, so please welcome Bruce. Let's see if we can get this. Am I too loud? Okay. First of all, it is an honor to be here. And this is my 20th festival of books I've attended. I missed the first one. But I read about it in the papers, and I went, ah, maybe, maybe there's something going on here. And it, it's a highlight. It's a highlight of my year. I, I really love it, the networking and everything. And I always regret that I don't get to everything. But you can't do that. That's probably my biggest regret. So um, I, I got some written text here, because I think it's important 
I wanted to say these words because, um, well, for the next four years, I am the ambassador for poetry in South Dakota, and I take this seriously. I see much of living's one life as art. Poetry is art through words. As was pointed out, I, I ranch and farm the same land as my uh, great-grandfather, and he didn't record anything, wrote anything down, and I always wondered what it would have been like to have had him told me about a day in his life. And I'm sure he would have thought it was just ho-hum, no big deal. But, you know, that was back in the 1880s, and it would have been in, um, remarkable. Well, that's why I got started writing, because I thought, well, maybe he did. But I could go ahead and start recording, and it ended up my way is through Freer's poetry, start recording my times, the stories I've been told, my neighbors. So, you know, that's, what, that's why, that, that's what motivated me, because I wanted the future to know. I wanted my great-grandchildren to know. And at that time, I didn't have any great-grandchildren. So, and I didn't have any grandchildren. So, that, that's, that's who I, that was who my audience was. And um, poetry is storytelling. Poetry helps us think clearly. Poetry leads us to truth. Writing and sharing poetry are powerful ways to convey what we value, what's in our lives, our passions. By listening to the poetry of others, we find commonalities and step into other shoes, walk their mile, see what they see, hear, feel what they feel. Poetry does not have to be complicated, but it has to be honest. It has to come from the heart. I encourage people from all walks of life to write, and that is the ambassadorship that I am on, because that's what I'm going to do for the next four years, is encourage people to write poetry and share it among each other. Because if you just write it and keep it to yourself, it's just a diary. That's where it takes courage to go ahead and do that sharing. Uh, I want other people to tell me the why. Tell me about a day in your life. There's no such thing as an unremarkable day in anyone's life. That I firmly believe. It's hard to write a book. Many of you in this gathering has written a book. Writing a good poem is also hard to do, but I think is more achievable. A poem is something that we write in the cracks of our life. 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there. And over a course of a lifetime, we end up recording what's in our heart, what's in our life, and we're able to go ahead and then share that forward into the future, a gift. Now, uh, we give this gift of ourselves, our time, and place. We're allowing others to know us, to find what connects us. That's what poetry does. It connects us. That is the, that one of the greatest power of words as art is that finding that connection in our common humanity. When we write a poem, we help the arc of history bend a little further toward the light. Tell me the what. Tell me the why of your life. I want to hear your stories. Now, I'm going to read four poems. Uh, this first poem I'm going to read, 
I wrote in my head, I had it in my head probably for 15, 20 years. Because I didn't really start writing until my early 50s. You know, I had a little bit of a health scare. And I was going to write a book in the back of my head and about my times, about, you know, my thoughts. And then it occurred to me if I didn't start writing, it was never going to happen. And I, 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 you know, I went to college. And by choice, I came back. Uh, I was trained to be a mid-level bureaucrat, you know, the, the kind that people hate. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I had a chance to come back. And when I came back, I knew it, thought it was the hardest decision. I was coming back to the land. That is before a lot of the modern machinery and a lot of labor-saving devices. But I wanted to come back because I wanted to test myself. And so this is a poem. It was in my head for many years before I finally wrote it down. It's called A Prairie Prayer. Here on this ark of grass, sun, and sky, I will stay and see if I thrive. Others leave. They say it's too hard. I say, hammer my spirit in, spread me to rise and to rise and see if I break. Let the blizzard hit my face, let my skin feel the winter's breeze. Let the heat of summer's extreme try to hear the flesh from my bone. Who I have what it takes to survive or Oh, I shatter and break. Hammer me thin, stretch me from horizon to horizon. I need to know the character that lies within. I want to touch a little further beyond my reach for the something that I see. Only then let my spirit This next poem is about something I think a lot of us, you know, we don't appreciate as much where we live, uh, which is the night sky. We can see the sky. A lot of people, they live in places, you know, they got buildings, they got lights, uh, trees, mountains, something that's not scary. But here, just about any place in South Dakota, you can walk out and you can see the night sky. And I think it's wonderful. And my favorite part of that night sky is always been a full moon. Um, moonshine. There's always something mystical about a sky lighted by moonshine. Stars are present, but gentle. Clouds floating across the night sky or a translucent light. The moon lighted earth can be traveled about without need of any additional light. I have stood in the middle of my yard and I've read a newspaper. I knew moonshine. When was it that we became afraid of the dark like death? hiding in our cities of life. In doing so, we have lost that half of the night that is moonshine. With the full moon upon our countryside, it's easy to imagine. Walking out, driving over the land, disappearing into the shadows to find the mystery that you know has only been on the very edge of your life. By the road, all of moonshine. <laughs> well, okay, so as I said, I, I came back to the Bond Ranch and I had great timing. I came back in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, you heard of the farm crisis, right? Uh, it was terrible. Uh, people my age, 
by uh, three out of five of those people, couples, married couples with kids even, they had to leave, you know, and none of them left voluntarily. None of them. And I had to think about this. Through the 80s and 90s, until I finally wrote this poem, what, why, 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 why try so hard to stay on a piece of land? You know, it's what, what both. And it came back to the fact, I think that answer is in our hearts. What connects us to the scent of rain on the earth, to the last sight of peace in the fall, to the first sight of peace in the spring, to the first gasping breath of the newborn calf, to the warmth of our homes when winter wind blows? We are the sum of our senses and more. We who grow a living from the land cannot live without being connected to this sky and to this earth. Hearing the song of birds as they give wing, feeling life in our every step as we stride through our days. Still, we lie awake at night, worrying whether ends will meet, whether the path we have taken will work out, whether the rain will come, whether the sun will shine, whether our will and physical core shall weaken or stay the course. We have found the good while dealing with the bad. We have stayed when others have left. Such is the power of our land's beating heart. As South Dakota's eighth Port Maria, I want to celebrate. We want to know. Sing to me of South Dakota. Tell it like Carl Sandburg did about Chicago's big shoulders. Tell me about the workers of infinite variety within the state. How goes the day? Tell me the what. Tell me the why. Tell me about a day in your life. Did spring creep up on you one fine morning on cat's feet as you beheld your first crocus? Was the snow of winter fairly gone? Who have not had a night of the dark soul that broke on through to the other side? Did you light your candle on both ends with a flame so bright that now, year later, you were ever so more wise? Have you climbed the former Harney Peak and from that vantage point seen five different states? Standing on the dome, did you hear Black Elk speak for the words whispered, did they roar? Tell me, if you climb, <laughs> tell me if Sioux Falls is the best little city on a summer's Friday evening's air, as the young and restless, arm in arm, slow dance down the sculpture walk on Phillips Avenue. Tell me about the endless prairie, quarter section, row crop and drill. Tell me of short grass, cattle, and small town bars. Blue sky, red till hot, until you reach the distant hills. Then sing to me of Brown City. Main Street Square, pop into the sounds of music, mingling with the sunset colors rainbow pulsing water stone spray. Sing me, all of South Dakota, sing me of your life, for the good of poetry, for the celebrating, the telling, in the golden age of we. All that is blessed, all that is struggle, tell me your heart. 
Sing of yourself. Sing South Dakota. I want to hear the voices of angels. I want to hear Walt Whitman's barbaric yelps singing through you. This shall be my next 40 years. So thank you. Shelly C. Lowe is a citizen of the Navajo Nation and grew up on the Navajo Reservation in Ganado, Arizona. From 2015 to 2022, she served as a member of the National Council on the Humanities, the 26th member advisory body to the NEH, an appointment she received from President Obama. Lowe's career in higher education has included roles as the executive director of the Harvard University Native American Program, Assistant Dean in the Yale College Dean's Office and Director of the Native American Cultural Center at Yale University. Prior to these positions, she spent six years as a graduate in our discussion, Joyce said something and that stayed with me. She said, mm -hmm. poets are witnesses. They tell stories that come alive when you speak them and share them. Book festivals like this one here in South Dakota become almost magical events, bringing together a multitude of witnesses. There are poets and authors all around us, putting into words a story too stirring, stirring, too large to keep to themselves. They are using their words and images to bear witness to a history, to a world, and to individuals we've never known. They are keeping someone's story and history alive. Just as Ruth has kind of shown us, he is a witness to his own story, sharing it with us. And just like Bruce, the novelist Angeline Bully, who was also at the National Book Festival, spoke on opening night and told the story of her debut novel, the New York Times bestselling book, Firekeeper's Daughter. Angeline explained that she was 44 when she started writing her novel. She told herself, she could write the world's fir worst first draft, or she could not write it and keep the story to herself, mm -hmm. a story that she had also had in her mind for decades. Instead of keeping it to herself, she decided to take a chance. She wrote a book about an Ojibwe girl who solves a murder. Angeline chose to be a witness to keep a person and a world alive. At the National Endowment for the Humanities, or any age, we are proud to support the South Dakota Festival of Book and its wonderful panels, workshops, and readings. NEH helps make possible the Council's Young Readers Initiative, which connects children with new books every year, as well as the Veteran Story Contest, which invites veterans to share their experiences and keep alive an important history. Last month, NEH also awarded a grant to Joseph Horowitz for Music Unwound a series of public programs, and some in partnership with the South Dakota Symphony that bring together classical music and cultural and historical scholarship, building a bridge one concert at a time. While it is not a book project, I think the initiative like this, Music Fun Love, captures the same spirit of what we're doing here today, which is telling stories in harmony. What all this work has in common is that it is telling the truth and carrying that truth forward. As Louise Erdrich, one of my favorite novelists and a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians, writes in her novel, The Key to Joan, life will break you. Nobody can protect you from that. You have to love. You have to feel. It is the reason you are here on Earth. The stories that grip us, that we celebrate at festivals like this, 
are bound up in feeling, in love. They center a character who's lost, who's been wronged, who's seen an injustice. But they're also books about triumph, about people who reach out a hand to another, who take one step toward another and into the unknown. There's, quite, there's nothing quite like an amazing story. When you fall in love with a paragraph or even just a single sentence, the world sits still for just a moment. Suddenly, it's just you and the author. The characters could be worlds away, but for a second, they are right there next to you. For a second, they are alive. Great writers do that. Tonight, we have with us one such great writer, David Graham, a New York Times bestselling author and award-winning journalist at the New Yorker. At the National Book Festival, David told us about his lifelong love of stories. Growing up, his grandmother would tell him tales about his grandfather, about his adventures, about fleeing Russia on foot, and about motorcycle racing. As David put it, those stories unlocked a person for me. When he began work at the New Yorker, David found himself spending, in his words, so much obsessive time reporting. As he explained, I wanted to see everything, read everything. He knew he had to write a book, and so he did. David is now the author of numerous titles, including The Lost City of Z, A Tale of Deadly Obsession in the Amazon, Killers of the Flower Moon, and American Crime and, and the Birth of the FBI, which as you all know, is the subject of a Martin Scorsese movie coming out. We're all super excited next month. He's already seen it four times. <laughs> <laughs> and most recently, The Wait, a tale of shipwreck, mutiny, and murder. It is now my pleasure to welcome David Grant to the stage so we may hear from him more tales about book writing, obsessive reading, and the need to bear witness. <laughs> Um, who that figure was, it led me 
to what I would come to realize was one of the most sinister crimes in American history. A story that I believe tells a much larger history about this country today. Here you can see that part of that photograph that was taken in the museum. And now to understand uh, these crimes that took place um, in the early 20th century, you need to understand that back then, the Osage were among the wealthiest people per capita in the world because of vast oil deposits under their land. Uh, to um, uh, extract that oil, uh, oil men had to pay for leases and royalties to Osage. And so there were about 2,000 or so members on the Osage tribal roll, and they would quarterly, each quarter of a year, they would receive a check. And initially, it amounted to just a little bit of money, but over time, as more and more oil was well, reporters would travel out to Osage territory, and with a great deal of prejudice and sensationalism, they would regale the readers with stories about the quote unquote plutocratic Osage and about. Osage who had white servants. It was said at the time, whereas one Osage might own a car, each Osage owned 11 of them. And sometimes when you're researching a project, you actually can find nuggets about it even when the project is finished. And I'm gonna show you a video that I discovered after the book was completed, Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, it was found in an Osage's uh, basement, um, and it's a video shot by one of her ancestors and you're gonna see exactly what Osage territory looked like in the 1920s uh, during the oil boom uh, when these crimes took place. Now, the tangled history of how the Osage had gotten hold of that oil-rich land goes back to the 17th century when the Osage had laid claim to much of the central part of the country, a territory that stretched from what is now Missouri and Kansas all the way to the Rockies. President Thomas Jefferson called the Osage a great nation. And in 1804, he met with a delegation of Osage chiefs and he assured them that, quote unquote, they would know our nation only as friends and benefactors. But of course, within just a few years, uh, settlers began to drive the Osage off their lands. They were forced to cede more than 100 million acres of their ancestral lands. And they were eventually confined to a reservation in Kansas in the uh, 1860s, where once more they were under siege by white settlers. There was a massacre. And then in uh, the 1870s, the Osage under duress finally agreed to sell their lands. And they searched for a new homeland. And the Ida Territory, what was then Indian Territory, what is today Oklahoma, it was a vast area. It was about the size of Delaware. But it was rocky and hilly and infertile. So most white settlers considered it worthless, which is why this Osage chief stood up at a tribal council meeting. He said, our people should move there because the white people will finally leave us alone, and our people will be happy there. And so they resettled there. It's important to understand they had a deed to their land. They purchased it for 70 cents per acre, and they went there. By then, the forced migration, disease, and massacres had taken a tremendous toll on the Osage Nation. Their numbers had dwindled to just a quarter of what they had been a century earlier. And then in 1906, um, the U.S. government forced upon the Osage, or tried to force upon the Osage, the culmination of its very brutal assimilation campaign, which was allotment. And allotment was a policy to try to break up the communal ownership of, um, uh, of Native American communal lands, to turn them into private property owners, which would not incidentally make it much easier for white settlers to procure or swing over those lands. Um, but when the Osage were negotiating the terms with their government, the federal government over a lot, and they had more leverage than many of the other First Nations in Indian Territory. They were the last to be allotted. They had a deed to their land. There was a great race at that time to turn that area into the state of Oklahoma. And they were also led by one of the greatest chiefs, a man who spoke seven languages, including French, Sui, and Latin. And during the nego negotiations, the Osage inserted into their treaty what at the time seemed like a rather curious provision it said, we shall maintain all the subsurface mineral rights to our land. Um, at that time, nobody thought the Osage was sitting upon
on a porch, and what was known was that there was at least a trickle of love beneath it. And the Osage very shrewdly managed to hold on to this last realm of their territory, a land they could not even see. Now, after allotment went through and Oklahoma became a state, much of the surface territory that the Osage had, had rapidly disappeared, as so often happened into the hands of whites. But each Osage, or about 2,000 of them, on the tribal roll was given a headright, which was essentially a share in a mineral trust. And a headright could not be bought or sold. It could only be inherited. So even as the surface land disappeared into the hands of whites, this area beneath the reservation uh, remained collectively controlled by the Osage. They continued to control an area about the size of Delaware beneath the surface. They had become the world's first underground reservation. And before long, oil, vast oil, was discovered. And so many of the oil barons whose names are familiar to us today, like G.P. Getty and the Phillips brothers, who you can see here, would head out to Osage territory to attend auctions bidding on leases. These leases for about 160 tract of land would sell for as much as a million or even two million dollars. And this elm tree where they were gathered became known as the million dollar elm. Now, as the Osage wealth increased, it provoked a great deal of racism and alarm across the country. Members of the US Congress would hold debates hours and hours at a time, saying, what are we going to do about these Osage and all their money and all their riches? And they went so far to pass legislation creating a system of guardianships. And this system was not abstractly racist. It was literally racist. It was based on the quantum of Osage blood. So if you were a cold-blooded Osage, you were deemed, quote, unquote, incompetent, and you were given one of these guardians. And they would suddenly dictate whether you could get that toothpaste or that car, even if you were an Osage chief leading the nation. And not only was it a racist system, it also ushered in one of the largest state and federally sanctioned criminal enterprises as uh, the guardians began to swindle hundreds of millions of dollars and embezzle millions of dollars from the Osage. And I just want to read from you, um, if I can find it, uh, a quote from um, an Osage chief, Bacon Ryan because he testified uh, in Congress. And he said, well, essentially what he said was um, that, well, essentially what he said was that whites had bunched us down into this worthless, rocky territory, only discover riches, and now everybody wanted to come in and get some of that riches. And before long, many of those sage began to die in mysterious circumstances, and one family was profoundly impacted, and that was the family of this woman, Molly Burkhart, uh, who was born in 1886, She's really a remarkable woman, um, she grew up in a lodge, speaking Osage, practicing Osage traditions. Then she was, just as a young girl, seven or eight, forcibly uprooted from her home, made to attend a missionary boarding school. She was no longer allowed to speak Osage. She had to remove her blanket, and she was forced to capture what they referred to then as the white man's tongue. And then because of oil deposits, within just a few decades, she was living in a large terracotta house. She had white servants. And she had married a settler from Texas named Ernest Burkhart. She had met him because he had been her chauffeur. Um, and even though he drank and played poker, she thought uh, she detected a sensitivity uh, beneath that rough exterior and fell in love with him. And they had three children together. Now Molly liked to entertain. And one night in 1921, she had a party at her house. And her older sister, Anna Brown, came. And at 5 p.m., she left the house. And she disappeared. Molly looked everywhere for her. And a week later, she was found in this ravine, shot in the back of the head. This photograph was taken by a detective at the time. And then within just a few days, Molly's mother, Lizzie, began to grow mysteriously sick. Each day, she seemed to grow more insubstantial. And within two months, she died. 
The evidence indicated that she had been poisoned. So within the span of just two months, Molly had lost her older sister and her mother, who was one of the Osage elders, and one of the tethers to the old way of life, to the language and the traditions. And Molly had a younger sister named Rita, who was so frightened by these killings um, that she decided to move closer to town, to be closer to Molly. She moved into this house with her husband and an 18-year-old maid. And then one night, Molly heard a loud explosion, and she went to the window. She peered out into the darkness, and she saw a large orange ball rising into the sky as the sun burst violently into the night. It turned out somebody had planted a bomb under her sister's house, killing not only Rita, but Rita's husband, the 18-year-old maid who left behind two young children. And it wasn't only Molly's family that was being systematically targeted, so were many other Osage. There was poisonings, shootings. Even those who tried to catch the killings themselves were sometimes killed. One man went to Washington, D.C. at the behest of the Osage to try to alert federal authorities to what was happening. He checked into a boarding house. He carried with him a pistol and a Bible. He received a telegram from Osage that said, be careful. He left the boarding house that evening. He was abducted and his body was found in the culvert the next morning. He had been shot and beaten to death. And the Washington Post carried a headline that announced what the Osage had long already known. It said a conspiracy to kill rich American Indians. Now, many of the Osage, including Molly, valiantly and courageously crusaded for justice, often at great risk to their own lives. But their pleas were ignored by the white authorities because of prejudice, <coughs> because they took the Osage, and because of widespread corruption at that time in the system. And so Molly eventually turned for help to this man here, William K. Hill, who was the uncle of her husband, Ernest. He had arrived at the turn of the century in Osage County as a poor uh, cowboy. But over time, he had become a cattle bearer, and he was probably the most powerful figure in Osage territory. He was a deputy chef, shepherd, uh, I'm sorry, he was a deputy sheriff who crusaded for what he called God-fearing souls, and he was known as the king of the Osage Hills. Uh, and he, along with Molly, <coughs> issued rewards, hired private detectives, but all to no avail. And so finally, in 1923, the Osage Tribal Council issued a resolution pleading for federal authorities to intervene. And it was then that the case was taken up by a rather obscure branch of the Justice Department, the Bureau of Investigation, which of course we now know today as the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or the FBI. And I won't get into all the cases that had many ups and downs and failures and disasters, but ultimately they sent in an undercover team, uh, imposed as cattlemen and insurance men. And what they did is they followed the money. And in particular, they followed the money to see who was profiting from the murders of Molly Burkhardt's family. Um, to see who was profiting from the murder. Now remember, a head right, which was this share in the middle, in the middle trust, could not be bought or sold. It could only be inherited. So they traced the wills, trying to see where the money was going. And the more they studied the flow of the money, the more they realized it actually followed a systematic pattern. Even the murder seemed to have been done chronologically, so that the money was flowing down like a funnel until it reached Molly Burkhardt, whose fortune was controlled by her husband, Ernest Burkhardt. What's more, What's more, these crimes against Molly's family were orchestrated by none other than the William K. Hill, the king of the Osage Hills, this man of so-called God-fearing souls. And what made these crimes so deeply sinister is that they involved an intimate level of betrayal. These were inherited schemes. So they involve people marrying into your family while pretending to love you and systematically plotting to kill you and often even your children. 
Now I have a question. How many of you were ever taught this history? Raise your hands. Well, I count myself among you. And I certainly was not aware of it when I began researching it. And to try to understand what happened, I scoured the archives. And one of the documents I found was from 1934, if my memory serves correctly. Um, Molly was about 43 years old, uh, shortly before she died of natural causes. And it was an appeal of her, quote unquote, incompetency. And the court had then granted her, uh, deemed her competent. So only then, only then in 1934, <coughs> was Molly Burkhardt granted access to what remained of her until her fortune. Only then was she granted the full fledged rights. And the other path of my research led me to many of the descendants, to the descendants of both the murderers and the victims, many of whom still live side by side in the same neighborhoods today. And one of the most powerful um, interviews and meetings I had took place with Marjorie Burkhardt, the granddaughter of Molly, who told me stories about Molly and her oral history, took me out the graveyard where so many of her ancestors were buried who were murdered. And it was talking to Molly that underscored to me how this is still living history. We're talking about, we're not talking about colonial times, but I was doing research was less than a century before. This history still reverberates into the present. Now, the more I interviewed Osage elders, and the more I researched documents, the more my understanding of what happened really took place, and the version of history that was often told was completely bunk. As I interviewed many Osage elders, they would often tell me about other suspicious deaths in their family. There was an Osage elder named Mary Jo Webb, who when I was visiting with her, went to her closet and pulled out a box filled with these old documents. I said, what are they? She said, well, these are records from my own investigation into one of these murders that was never properly investigated. And then one day I was at a branch of the National Archives in Fort Worth, Texas, and I was doing research on the guardianship system. And I was pulling all these boxes, and one of those boxes I found a little booklet. It looked like something you sign when you kind of go into an inn and you stay there. And all it was was a list of guardians and those sages whose fortunes they had managed, covering just a few years. Um, and the only other thing in this booklet was if an Osage had died, somebody had written next to their name, dead. So I opened it up, I began looking. It. And near uh, one of the uh, uh, guardian's names, I saw five Osage's fortunes who this man had, had, uh, had um, uh, managed. And I noticed next to the first name, the word dead. And I looked at the next name, dead. Dead, dead, dead. Oh, my God, that is so strange. And then I began to look through the booklet, and I saw another guardian who had about uh, 12 Osage's fortunes that this man had. And I noticed that about 50% of them were listed as dead. And I kept going to the book, I kept seeing similar patterns. Now, needless to say, some of these deaths were natural causes, but the amount over just a few years to find any natural death rate. If you remember, those sages weren't starving, you had money, they had access to help. And then I began to try to investigate some of the names that were listed as dead. And at least in some of the cases, I could find trails of evidence, complaints of a poisoning of a head right that had been stolen. And I began to realize that this little book right contained the hints of a systematic murder campaign. And it was records like this that again demolished the conception I had, which was the conception that the FBI had put out that it had solved the case when it had captured Hale and Ernest and another henchman. This was not actually history about a singular evil figure, which is much easier for us all to process. This was about a culture of killing and a culture of complicity. It was about morticians who would cover up bullet wounds. It was about doctors who would administer poisons. It was about lawmen and prosecutors who were complicit and on the tape. And it was involved many others who were complicit in their silence because they were all getting wealthy and what they referred to in the documents as the quote unquote Indian in business. Now, 
When I visited the Osage Nation Museum that day and saw that picture the first time, the museum director, Catherine Redform, went down into the basement and she pulled up an image of a missing panel. And there, peering up very creepily from the corner with his little chapeau and glasses, was none other than William K. Hill. And I was always deeply haunted by this event because I kept thinking that the Osage have removed this photograph not to forget, but because they cannot forget. And yet so many people, including myself, had never been taught this history. We had, in effect, excised it from our conscience. And it actually led me, in a very roundabout way, to my latest research project about the wager. And the stories could not be any more different for anyone who reads the book. Um, this one is about a shipwreck, it's, it, it's very different, but the themes, um, as I, I'll try to tell you just briefly about overlap, because what I became deeply interested in is why do certain stories become part of our collective consciousness? How do we shape our stories? How do we shape our history? How do we learn from it? What do we take from it? And research, I always say, can lead you to the most unexpected place, and in this case, it led me, uh, as you can tell, I'm not much of an explorer, onto a little wood-heated boat off the coast of Patagonia, bouncing around in these tremendous waves with just about every seasick medicine known to man <laughs> trying out. I had the thing behind my ears, I had the bracelet, and I was half drunk on Dramamine. <laughs> and all I could do was just sit on the floor and hunker down and as I looked out the window, I kept looking for this place, hoping to glimpse an image of a place that had consumed my imagination to a major island. It was there that one of the most extraordinary sagas of survival and mayhem that I'd ever come across had taken place. A saga that had influenced Rousseau and Voltaire, the scientist Charles Darwin, two of the great novelists of the sea, Herman Melville and Patrick O'Brien. And it began when in 1742, a small little boat, a little, a little boat, you can see this is very similar to what it looked like, washed the shore off the coast of Brazil. And crammed on board were 30 men, their bodies almost wasted to the bone, their hair tangled like seaweed. And one of them announced that they were the survivors of his majesty's ship to wager. And after being shipwrecked on a desolate island, um, after being shipwrecked on a British naval warship, um, they had ended up on this island and they had eventually built this little castaway boat and traversed some 3,000 miles. And they were greeted with disbelief and they were healed as heroes and for their courage. But then, several months later, another little boat washed ashore this one off the other side of South America.